Here is Dr. Keith Smith. Wow, what a crowd for a first meeting. Congratulations, Matt and the rest of the team. This is unbelievable, really. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Um, this is really a nightmare uh, for, for the bad guys, uh, what my friend Jay Kempton calls the black hats. These are the conversations that are not supposed to happen. Uh, the conversations where buyers and sellers speak to each other directly. The real nightmare on a personal level is the more the People's Republic of Wisconsin gets their act together, the less for referrals I get at Surgery Center of Oklahoma from Wisconsin. So I would say we see people from Wisconsin probably six times a month. Uh, they come to Oklahoma City for surgery and you know, if, if this continues, I, I would imagine that will stop. So, but I'm rooting for you. <laughs> so I'm an anesthesiologist. I started my practice in 1990, um, cardiac and pediatric fellowship trained. I was recruited to Oklahoma City uh, primarily to do hearts. Um, in 1992, uh, the federal government, uh, along with uh, some idiots at Harvard, decided to launch what is now known as the Resource-Based Value Scale, RBRVS. Uh, I call it the Rosemary's Baby of healthcare. Um, but it was essentially a group of academics who thought that they could attach a price to every single service that a physician provided. And they got them all wrong. Uh, there are a lot that are too high, uh, and there are a lot that are too low. Uh, the ones that are too low cause shortages, uh, the ones that are too high cause surpluses of a lot of different kinds of care that really should never have been done. At the time, I was paid about $1,100 uh, for an open heart surgery for which I provided the anesthesia care. Um, the last one I did um, was a six-hour case, um, and the year before, you know, they cut me from $1,100 to $550, the last one I did, well, I was paid $283 for, for a six-hour open-heart surgery. Um, and the, you know, they got it wrong. They, they were sending me a price signal, and I'd read enough economics by that time to understand this is a, this is a signal, this is not personal, and I need to respond with a rational signal of my own. So I quit. Uh, they caused they caused a shortage of Keith Smith. They just got my price wrong. But I didn't quit seeing Medicare patients. I just quit filing claims. I didn't feel like I could grant legitimacy to what I knew then was a completely illegitimate program. Ideologically, I'd arrived at a place by then where I also realized the government didn't have any money that they'd not first stolen. And so that made me the recipient of stolen property by filing those claims. So I just, I quit filing and I provided that care charitably and remembered that lesson uh, that the government's always a bad partner um, and that pricing that's imposed is always wrong. The only true pricing in the marketplace is pricing that emerges from competitive activity. And that's important for everybody to really understand. So while my fees were cut and most of the physicians I worked with were cut drastically, we noticed the hospital was building on. And they were building on to their administrative staff. Um, and they were building on to their hospital, all the while poor mouthing it, saying we don't have the tools that these surgeons need to appropriately perform these surgeries. You know, we're all, we're all going broke. And we're still hearing that poor mouthing narrative from the hospitals the rural hospitals I'm sympathetic with because they've been victimized by the big boys. But the big hospital systems are rolling in money and have been for a long time with very few exceptions. Well, we, we heard this poor mouthing crap and they wouldn't give us what we needed to do the cases and we were being paid poorly. So as an anesthesiologist, there really was only one thing I could do and that was walk out and... Uh, seek ownership and control of my own facility. So Steve Lantier, 
very like-minded anesthesiologist. Uh, we walked away from what anyone in this room would consider a lucrative anesthesia practice and opened our own facility. We had a very simple mission. We were going to make sure that patients knew what they were gonna pay us before they arrived and we were gonna provide the highest quality care and we would never take a dime of money from the federal government, and we never have. Uh, we've seen Medicare patients, we just, don't, we just don't file claims. So in 1997, we, we opened the Surgery Center of Oklahoma with that very simple mission, and within a week, um, what we had in mind, what we'd envisioned materialized. A young lady called with a breast mass and she wanted to know how much. She didn't have insurance. And Steve and I high-fived, I'm pretty sure, but we didn't know the answer to her question. <laughs> so <clears throat> I called the surgeon while she was on hold and asked him how much he wanted, and he didn't know. So I said, well, like some RBRVS Harvard fool, I'll put a price on you. You tell me. He said, well, $500. And I thought that was pretty reasonable, actually pretty cheap. I knew the case would take about 30 minutes. I knew it would take 30 minutes of my time as an anesthesiologist. The supplies were not gonna be formidable. So after I called a pathologist friend of mine to ask for his fee, because she was gonna wanna know if she had cancer, and he wanted $28 to examine this breast mass. So he said, that's what Medicare pays me. And he didn't know how to answer me otherwise. So I added it all up and told her $1,900. And she said, well, that's interesting. The hospital down the street, the so-called not-for-profit hospital, wanted 19,000 just for the facility. So we marched along week after week, hearing these stories from patients that the prices we were quoting were one-tenth of what the hospitals were quoting, and our fee was all-inclusive. The hospital was just quoting a hospital. Ours included surgeon, anesthesia, and facility, and we were making money. So I didn't change any of the prices that I quoted over the phone in 1997 until three years ago. So, yeah. And part of the reason for that is when a vendor gave us a better deal, I extended that to the buyer. I thought that just keeps me competitive. So we worked in this facility for about six years, sustained so many attacks from the state capital, from the insurance companies, from the health department. Um, the, the health department was weaponized against us. It, I, could, I could write a book, I probably should, but we, we always end up in the underdog position. We were always seen as a champion of the poor. The, you know, what about the poor? Well, the, those are the people coming to us because they can't afford your, you know, hospital. But in 2003, we built this facility. So this is a huge facility. It's um, 35,000 square feet and there are now 168 surgeons on staff. I started with 10. So we get in this facility, all's going well, and the state insurance commissioner, uh, working very closely with the largest carrier in the state, came up with a formula to hurt us. We were filing out-of-network claims, but never taking a dime from a patient more than they would have paid had they gone in network. That's how we started. Many times what we quoted them all inclusive was less than their in-network deductible. So you imagine how the hospitals and the carriers felt about all this. Well, they finally stacked deductibles. They figured it out and they told patients, you have no out-of-network benefit unless you've met your in-network deductible. And it, it closed our doors, really. We, our, our waiting room emptied and I wasn't sure what we were going to do. We just built this place, fortunately built it debt-free. Um, and so 2006, 2007 looked pretty bad. Um, in 2009, I decided to just put all the prices online. Let's see. This is our website currently. 
you know, I thought I should call some of these self-funded company CEOs that I know socially and say, you know, how much are you paying for a total knee or a tonsillectomy or a cochlear implant? And whatever they tell me, I'll beat it. And then I thought, no, I need to tell them how much we'll do it for. I mean, in a marketplace, this is what I do and here's how much it is and market judge me. That's how every other industry works. And then I thought, no, I need to tell everyone. So I launched this website and you can point at any of these circles if you go to surgerycenterok.com um, and pick your procedure and that's what you'll see. So an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction is $7,931. That's facility surgeon anesthesia. Uh, bilateral knee arthroscopy, $6,215. So, launch this website, and who shows up? Canadians. They were the first ones. <laughs> they were the, this great system they have. And yeah, the Canadians were the first ones to show up. And then uninsured patients from all over the country began to come. Um, and then I met a fellow named Jay Kempton, who um, has the Kempton Group, a third-party administrator. And Jay said, will you sell my clients that for that price? And I said, yeah, my pricing's the same for everyone. And he shook his head. He said, you have no idea how radical that is, that you don't care about the size of the group. I said, no, I mean, this, it's the same for an individual as it would be for, for a huge group. So Jay and I started working together, and my education about what self-funding meant began. Um, we were self-funded at the time for the benefit of the employees at Surgery Center of Oklahoma, so I knew a little bit. Uh, but what I did not understand was, why do the carriers hate me? You know, why do they, why does... Blue United, Cigna, Aetna, Humana, why do they hate me? Why do they not want cheaper and better? And it never occurred to me in my wildest dreams that cheaper and better was their worst nightmare. So I, I launched this website. Um, I did it after being very thoughtful because the attacks that I received um, just for having a physician-owned independent surgery center are, they're kind of indescribable and scary in a way. And I knew when I launched this website, there was gonna be blowback, but my goals were to make sure that the people that had sticker shock, uninsured, high deductible, self-funded plan, cost-sharing ministry, Canadians, that, you know, that they had a place to go that they could afford. And I wanted to start a price war. I wanted patients that were nowhere near Oklahoma City to print out our prices and go to their local hospital and say, match this or I'm going to Oklahoma City. My favorite story about that was a guy from Georgia who needed a transurethral resection of his prostate, a TERP. And the urologist said, you know, we'll do this at the hospital. And the guy said, I don't have any insurance. And he said, well, we'll get a price from the hospital. And he said, well, I've already got a price. <laughs> Surgery Center of Oklahoma wants $3,600. And he said, well, let's go over there. So they went to see the hospital administrator. And he said, well, no, we need 40000 And the urologist said, you know, I came over here because I lost a case. I lost a patient to Surgery Center of Oklahoma two months ago because of this, you need to step up. This is killing me. So the hospital matched our price. And the patient called me and he said, do you realize you saved me $36,000 and you didn't even perform the surgery? <laughs> so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to start a price war. And then I wanted to understand why Blue Cross hates me. Why is United not beating down my door? I didn't understand that, and I don't pretend, to, I'm, a, I'm an anesthesiologist, I'm a doctor, I don't pretend to understand all the scams, but I wanted to understand those better. I would argue all three of those goals have been achieved. So, data. There's probably 
people in this room that have a data fetish, is my guess. Here it is. I'm not big on data because a lot of it is just crap. But this is not. So Jay Kempton was kind enough to share this with me. You can tell by looking at this that with an average number of lives of about 38,000, now he has more now, but in the beginning he didn't. He had about 10 or 12 with about 35,000 average covered lives, the savings in 11 years is $192 million. So there are probably actuaries in this room, and if you think through that, then you can sort of get an idea about what kind of potential savings are out there if this is adopted on a widespread basis. So one of the scams that I became aware of and why the carriers hated us was repricing. So I was glad to hear that come up. Um, where the hospital is $100 for the aspirin, insurance pays them $25, hospital claims they lost $75, don't you know? Um, the carrier charges basically a commission on the savings achieved to the plan and the hospital loves it because that $75 of red ink, they claim, helps maintain the fiction of their not-for-profit status. So they're looking for red ink wherever they can find it. Um, there's so many scams, I, I can't even begin to get started, but that is why a $15,499 knee replacement at Surgery Center of Oklahoma, it's, it's not even on the radar of one of the carriers that's using plan money to buy $80,000, $120,000 joint replacements because they don't get to profit off the skim. But I'm here to tell you the biggest scammer of them all is the federal government. The federal government overpays hospitals. They overpay physicians who are hospital employees compared to independent doctors, and that is the money hospitals use to conduct so many of their shenanigans. New code books come out all the time that are incomprehensible. You all have heard about there is a code for an ACL injury while water skiing when you're hit by a turkey. I mean, it's, it is incomprehensible. It is so stupid. And the AMA is in on, they're in on the joke. I don't even know a physician that belongs to the AMA. 80% of the revenue the AMA receives comes from Uncle Sam for the monopoly contract to print the code books. So whenever you hear the AMA or the Journal of the American Medical Association is stepping up to protect doctors Oh, give me a break. They are so bought and paid for, and they're going to do whatever they're told. So when someone wants to throw the keys and the entire industry to the government, the government is behind all of these scams, repricing all of it. And they have basically sold all of these favors at auction in Washington, D.C., and this lobby is very, very effective and very powerful. So I don't think, and I don't advocate for change. I think it's unchangeable. I think it is a cesspool, and I think it cannot be cleaned up. I think what you all are doing and what we're trying to do at the Free Market Medical Association is create an alternative path, and then hopefully the buyers will patronize the alternative, and the other one will just wither. The Free Market Medical Association was the vision of Jay Kempton. Um, when Jay and I started working together, Jay would direct patients my way at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma away from one of my competitors because I would tell him, here's how much it is, and we'd stand behind it. 
Well, my competitors would call Jay and scream at him. Now, why are you taking this business? This patient was on the schedule for a total knee and you diverted it to Surgery Center of Oklahoma. And Jay said, because he'll tell me how much it is. Well, I would tell you how much it is if I could figure that out. And so these conversations are going on. And of course, I was getting calls too. You damn so-and-so, you know, you're stealing all my patients. You know, I got those calls too. And it's funny, they followed the grief pattern of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, if you're familiar. So sometimes they would call me when they were in denial and shock. And then sometimes they would call when they were just extremely angry and couldn't think through it. And then some of them would call and seriously cry. They were so sad uh, because they're being victimized by this market approach. And then eventually they would get to the acceptance phase. And when they got there, then I would teach them how to create surgical bundles and how to also implement them. So Jay also was getting this kind, these kind of conversations and his competitors didn't know how to work with someone like me because I will not send a HICFA form. I send an invoice. It's one page. Here's what we did. Here are the codes. Here's the price. Pay me. And I send an invoice and that's it. It's one page. And so Jay was teaching his competitors how to deal with me. I was teaching my competitors how to deal with Jay. And Jay said, we've got to form an association. We have got to get these people all together and see what comes of it. And it's huge now. We have 37 state chapters. And uh, we've had Ron Paul and Steve Forbes and Kennedy from Fox as keynotes. It's just, it's a wonderful organization. I encourage you to check it out. So is this movement having an effect? Well, I'll refresh your, your eyes and your brain with this. This is my website. This is UCLA's. Now, <laughs> now there's, there's a funny story. So everyone... And there are probably people in this room that have asked, can we talk to your web designers? Can we copy this website concept? I said, Absolutely. But UCLA didn't ask. They just did it. <laughs> and this wording right here is word for word what I have on my site. So my web designer said, you need to sue them. I said, oh, no. Because if you sue them, then in the, at the end of that, everybody's got to shut up about it, and I want to talk about them. So I show this every time I talk. So did they, did they launch a cash price website because they're good people who are trying to deliver value? No. They launched a website because there were a large number of people from Southern California that were flying to Oklahoma City on a nonstop American, fl American flight to have their child's cochlear implant placed or to have their knee replaced or have a hysterectomy, and that's why they did this. So, you know, what impact is this movement having, I think, is answered best by this slide. So I didn't pick this title. Matt did. Um, that the free market is our only hope. Um, but I love it because it is. And if we had a Star Wars theme, we could say, you're our only hope, you know, it'd be fun. But it, it is our only hope because it is the only peaceful, nonviolent way that individuals can work together is a free market where you have mutually beneficial exchange and both parties walk away better than they were before. Not one victimized, not this zero-sum stuff where I benefit at your expense. F mutually beneficial exchange is the, is the activity of peaceful people. And whenever you have violence in the marketplace, it's unstable. Uh, and so I would argue this quote 
from Franz Oppenheimer just really says it all. Can everybody see it? There are two fundamentally opposed means whereby men requiring sustenance is impelled to obtain the necessary means for satisfying his desires. These are work and robbery, one's own labor and the forcible appropriation of the labor of others. And so that's, robbery's unstable. And what we have now is a situation where multi-plan does exactly what was described. I mean, it's just robbery. So Oppenheimer also, he defines the work part where people exchange their labor as the economic means, but the appropriation of labor as the political means. And he, he also says that the um, government and the state is the institutionalization of robbery. So whenever I hear we should throw this whole industry into the arms of the state, I consider that very unstable. Um, and, and the market and the mutual benefit, the high, um, the high quality, the lower prices are the natural result of a market exchange. And I am thrilled to be here and thrilled to see you all here. And I'm going to stop.